Welcome to the Recruitment Rollercoaster podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz. Today I'm joined by someone you should all know and her name is Rhonda D'Ambrosio. She is a transformation director for Ebenable and also the founder of Mental Health in Recruitment. Rhonda is on a mission to drive positive change to the understanding of mental health issues in order to improve lives, improve business within the recruitment industry. Um, You should all know who Rhonda is. She's been involved in live podcast events. Uh, We also sat down on episode 69 um, a while ago. So hopefully you should know who Rhonda is. If you don't know her backstory, we'll touch on it today, but if you don't, feel free to go back to episode 69. And also, um, you might have seen that she's recently announced and launched Mental Health and Recruitment, which is what we're going to talk about today and have a have a focus on. So, Rhonda, always a pleasure to uh, chat to you. How are Hi, you? Hi, Hisham. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks so much for having me back back on another yeah, event. No, it's been a couple of times, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Um, you know, you're one, you're one of my favourites. <laughs> <laughs> but... Cool. So why why don't we why don't I just let you sort of tee this up then and sort of just give a bit of a background for people that may not know who you are um, and your story and then sort of we can tee that up into sort of mental health and recruitment why that exists. Let let's start there. Okay, no problem. So for those that don't know me, I'm Rhonda D'Ambrosio. I've been in the recruitment industry since 1997. Um, I've worked various jobs, I would say probably all level of roles in the industry, from running my own recruitment business to running other businesses. And in 2013, I diversified my recruitment organisation um, after an episode, a situation involving my mum, which we talked about in the last podcast. My mum got diagnosed with motor neurones disease, um, which took her life. But it was her mental resilience during that time that inspired me to learn much more about quality of thinking, flexibility of thinking, and how when we choose our responses to our emotions, we can positively impact our own mental health and mental well-being. So, you know, I kind of from 2013 onwards have been talking about mental health in the industry. Um, it, this gained some momentum in 2017 after a good friend and colleague of mine took his own life. And I guess the last three years have led me to this point I'm at today, which is the launch of mental health in recruitment. Mm. Yeah, so really driven by it's interesting, right? Whenever I've spoken to people around mental health and these things, there's always typically tip like really important parts of their life and typically not so good parts, right? Losing losing your mum or seeing what she's going through, losing a friend that sort of really sort of puts fire in people's belly to make change or change themselves, or whatever. So that's so that's interesting. So driven by things that have happened to you, real purpose, I guess. What what actually let's just start there. Obviously, mental health and recruitment, right, says what it is in, in the name, but like why why have you decided to launch mental health and recruitment? Do you know what? It's um it's it's a brilliant question and one I talk about all the time. I guess over the last however many years, um, and however many talks I've given, how many times I've stood up and addressed a room full of recruitment business um, owners or leaders there seemed to be a common theme that kept coming out. And it was this lack of understanding as to what mental health actually was. And this distinct disparity between physical health and mental well-being. And, you know, I get that we're a very resilient industry and we hire people that are able to bounce back. This is part of our hiring frameworks. These are part of our competency frameworks. But the reality was that, you know, when you looked at the stats within mental health and you looked at the common uh, mental health disorders that we are we know that are out there such as stress anxiety and depression there seemed to be this lack of understanding and education as to what that looked like you know so many recruitment businesses felt that wasn't and that's not our organization you know our people <laughs> are great everyone's good um you know and oh, there was this underlying assumption as well that you know the very successful people were all good everyone's happy then you know they're making money and that you know if you did perhaps deal with stress or you did have some issues that didn't make you capable so there was this paradox of uh, this is what I was seeing on a day-to-day basis there was this paradox of uh, uh, very much alive around businesses that felt they only hired the most resilient people and therefore they had this really strong workforce and mental health didn't impact them and then you had this um you know, that probably the same individuals that, that, that were dealing with their mental health and were having to do it, you know, beneath the surface. And, um, 
you know, that this is a lot of where the Titanic thinking methodology came along, which, um, as you may or may not remember, it's a, a coaching practice, a self-help or a, a, a leadership coaching um, method that really helps individuals dig under the surface as to you know what they're dealing with on an everyday basis so i think it was this complete and utter um polar opposite view whereby well you know we we cannot be the exception to the stats you know you have all of these and uh, this information that's out there you've got the thriving at work report that was published in 2017 and you've got this all of this information all of this analysis by deloitte and and i was like are we really saying that it doesn't impact us and then hand in hand with that, I would have the same business owners come up to me after the end of a talk I may have given. And they would say to me, do you know what? I don't know what I would do if an employee came to me and told me they were stressed. Yeah. So, you know, typically, I guess I was talking to, you know, SMEs. Um, if I did talk to the larger businesses, then they would always advocate for the fact they had an EAP, an employee assistance program, and that, yes, they did this and they did all these different initiatives. But what I found was, you know, I was most in demand in a mental health awareness week or when there was something in the calendar that would suggest we needed to talk about mental health. And, you know, I think that if I really get to the, you know, the, the crux of it, that was it for me. You know, we weren't doing this enough and we weren't doing this on a consistent basis. So, you know, a number of these organisations would definitely claim to be people first. But it was, oh, are you people first or are you trying to put a tick in a box? You know, and how can we really drive this change if we're kind of going against this, this tide and this understanding? So, um, you know, the idea for mental health and recruitment was very much born out of, you know, creating the awareness, creating the education in order to drive the positive action and the change and I think that stemmed from all of the different mental health awareness events or days that I did where I then may not hear from a business until the next <laughs> mental health yeah, awareness yeah. Day. so it's like you know god when can we talk about action what are you doing to drive this as action you know and, and are you doing it from the very top of the organization or is this just something that you're doing to fill up the calendar so, yeah because because I think that's it isn't it I think I think sometimes um I don't know, just from what I can see on, online and, and the content that I consume, sometimes I feel like it can be perceived as sort of people talking about mental health can sort of put the blame on companies that they're not, not doing anything about it and all these things. But I think really in reality, which is what you just shared there, the education piece and all these things is actually how many business leaders and how many business owners are equipped with the know-how and the the sort of experience and knowledge of how to deal with people that have mental health challenges and, and hardships, right? So I think that's the first thing that I think is really important to, to make clear is that this isn't you trying to say recruitment businesses only care about mental health for a week in, in the year. It's look, I, like what, clearly why you've built this and why you've actually created a vehicle is to actually help educate these people, which is clearly what they needed to give them a better chance of dealing with this right because i think yeah. that, that's the main thing isn't it is that this isn't companies don't care i'm sure these business leaders do care but have no idea where to start wouldn't know what to do if a lot of their staff came to them um and i think i think that's probably really evident during the coronavirus and the conversations that i'm having because you're having way more from the conversations that i'm having there's way more recruiters on the market because they haven't been pleased with how their business have acted they haven't communicated with them all these different things and then you've had businesses that really got their culture right know what they're about that has meant that they've managed to get more people but also meant that their people have actually thrived in these things mm -hmm. so i think that's the thing it's the education and, and the know-how so um how do you think we can actually move the needle on mental health and recruitment and is it bottom up bottom up change is it is it from the top down is it both like how, where, how can, do you know what I mean? Where, where do you think, it, where does the change need to happen? Do you think? So, you know, the out of the box answer, I would probably say is it has to come from the top. You need, you know, you do need to have the senior stakeholders involved with regard to changing any type of, you know, organizational culture. But I guess with mental health and recruitment, I'm trying to cover it from all angles. <laughs> so, you know, what you've got if, if, if for those that haven't checked it out, you've got the people element where, you know, that is a collection of um, individuals that are in the recruitment industry that are putting a stake in the ground and saying, we care about this message and we want to create noise and get more of it out there. 
we have got the um, podcast, which is aimed at speaking to people that have or have suffered with their own mental health. And, you know, by putting those stories out and by sharing those stories, and some of them are, you know, we, we cut quite close to the bone, but that creates the awareness and that normalizes the conversation. And that encourages more and more people to speak up and speak out, which inspires, again, there's, it's like a, you see, it's like a chemical reaction. Um, you know, so it's giving the community, the, the people within the industry that may suffer with a, with a voice, but also we've got the showcase element and the showcase part, which we're going to be launching soon, is a place where recruitment businesses that do do this well, recruitment business owners that have been doing this for some time and do support mental health for their people can really show what they're doing because that will inspire their peers to go, okay, right, brilliant. What have you done and how have you done it? Yeah. And that kind of ties into, you know, the thing I'm most proud of that we've talked about, and that's the awareness to action pledge and the awareness to action pledge. You know, it is inspired to a degree by the time to change employers pledge. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, but I'm not. Let, why don't you just give context on that? Because I wasn't aware of that when you told me about it. So, yeah. So the, the, the time to change employers pledge was kind of very much about um, trying to, to, to drive workplace and, and different corporate organizations to support mental health and to change and it was built very much on the core principles and standards that came out of the thriving at work report um, you know the thing with time to change is that it's not industry specific and it doesn't have to be but they've also retired it it's been a retired pledge so it gave people a good framework it, it's, it's a brilliant resource and i'd highly recommend anybody checks it out but you know for me i thought wow in recruitment I always joke that we kind of like shortcuts. We like things simplified. <laughs> We're so busy and recruitment business leaders just kind of like, what do I need to do? How do I do it? So the awareness to action pledge was about going out to the market and saying, okay, are you committed to supporting mental health and the mental health of your employees? Um, and if you're committed, you know, would you look at a roadmap to enable you to get some organizational change literally up and running? Now, the idea is that if an organization signs up to that, they're sort of saying, yeah, we care about this. We're, we're signing it. We're putting our name there. And we're making this very public declaration that we are going to drive forward as a company to look after and to recognize the importance of this in the workplace. But the, the, the roadmap element then helps and supports them and gives them some action. So it's exactly. not like a, it's not a strict set of rules, but like we said earlier and you said, it gives them a little bit of well, where do we start yeah and exactly. we're not over complicating it you know i'm not saying that all recruitment owners business leaders hr directors should make it complicated but sometimes something is better than nothing and you know actually when you baseline what some organizations are doing they are running initiatives they'll do stuff on the different days they'll do stuff all year long but what they might not have done is pulled that together in one well-being or wellness strategy so of course they're not then communicating and talking about their wellness strategy and perhaps it's not being addressed at board level which is where it needs to be so really this is just something that is you know if we can get recruitment businesses and recruitment business leaders to commit to doing this publicly to sign up to working through the roadmap then they are going to be in better shape than they were in previously and that's where we gain momentum and for me we truly Move, move the needle yeah yes. how, how long how long is the roadmap um, well uh, it's broken down into six components um some of it does reflect the core standards of thriving work as well but we've aimed to simplify it it's not gone out just yet because we're just making some final tweaks to it and the aim is that it's going to be something that people want to engage in and they know that if they've got a stakeholder within the business that can drive it it will be quite straightforward so that's the one thing that's happening in the background i know a lot of people have said to me it's been two weeks since launch what's going on um because I wasn't anticipating the response um, that we've had. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. You know, I would have, I, I, not that I wasn't thinking it would go out with a bang, but I've genuinely been overwhelmed with the amount of messages, the amount of people that want to get involved, organizations that want to support, um, organizations outside of the industry that want to collaborate. And there's just some phenomenal conversations happening right now whereby you think, oh, this could really help individuals. This could really, really support. The community and you know uh, Chris O'Connell one of the ambassadors who you spoke to on the podcast the other week you know he said to me last week you know sh should we be just looking at recruitment you know shouldn't we be going out to you know this is a big thing everyone should be doing it because he's really passionate about mental health and I'm like you know what absolutely but where the people that are involved with this have the greatest impact is recruitment 
you know, um, you know, I laugh, I was laughing. You're saying, you know, you don't, you know who Ronda is. You know, I don't think for one minute I'm a celebrity. In no, but <laughs> there's a lot know. of people who still don't know who you are. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of people that don't know who I am. Um, there's a lot of people that won't know who Natasha Clark is, despite her being the ex chief of people for S3, you know, the people that are involved, you know, are known to some degree within the industry. And it's that, in my opinion, that demonstrates we can we can have significant impact and we can make change. You know, at the moment, if we went out to the whole of the corporate world with our messaging, we are kind of playing in a really really big big pond, right? Yeah, no. Let, let's. I would encourage you to stay in. Let's sort recruitment out first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm all for changing the world, but for me, yeah. you know, I, I the reason recruitment's important to me is because you know, it as an industry. There is a, um, I'm not, I, I don't know what the demographic split is between men and women, but what I do know is that we are all under pressure and we all are impacted by the way in which the recruitment industry drives and pushes forward, whether it's KPIs, the way in which we're man managed, um, or among other things. But what I do know is that men's mental health rates are obviously far higher than women's and as if I consider the conversations I've been having for the podcast you know we don't share so many men are still afraid yeah. to talk about this and still afraid to be vulnerable and I think you know that's where you look at the industry and for me I, I'm talking to some really larger than life characters that I'm sure to everybody else look like they're fine they're strong they've got it sorted they're okay but the reality is behind the scenes under the surface these guys are dealing with some some awful yeah. stuff i think yeah, yeah i think i'd be confident i mean it's the majority male that listen to this podcast and i think you could probably you could have a confident guess that there's definitely more men in the recruitment industry than there are women and i think that's a really good point that you highlight there which is why i've tried to get some some males on here including chris just because i think as well if you look at the, the people that are really trying to drive this change, it is typically female led as well, right? It's yourself, it's Katie Maycock, it's uh, Michelle Flynn, all these. So I think that that's a, a really good point. So, so just two things. I know, I know, obviously we're not going to hold you to this, but I think just to sort of wrap up the context. So that roadmap then, are we looking at like a 12 month, like, it's got like a minimum 12 month roadmap or what, like just roughly, just for, just to fill in that context of, I know you're building it in these things, but if I was a business owner listening to this now, while I'm a recruiter and I'm want to tell my boss about it, um, I th yeah, is it is it like yeah, is that what we're talking here, like a, t a roadmap of like twelve months plus? Yeah, I think the roadmap will give people the direction in, yeah. and, and give them a signpost of kind of right. These are the things that you need to look at, you need to address, you need to build in. But there also needs to be a level of um, not measurement but whereby we check back and we are constantly communicating with an organization as to what they're doing how it's impacted maybe what the ROI has been what the feedback has been from the team from the staff and so on so I think it's like it's like there's a, there's a maintenance period and I kind of this ties into where mental health and recruitment may go in terms of a medium term longer term strategy and how we can impact going forward um, but it is very much a case of yeah you have to be seen to be doing these things and demonstrating that you're doing it and then sharing your story back to the industry to sort of demonstrate these things make a difference and to inspire other people to do it you know yeah exactly um, there is sense. no there is no cost for anyone to do this to do the awareness to action pledge you know you and I know, you know, every single element of mental health and recruitment, I've done myself, I've built myself, I've had no support, I've had no sponsorship. That's not me getting my small violin out. So, you know, we can all feel sorry for me. But that's to say that, you know, this is to me a fundamental topic that should be being covered in the industry. And, you know, I get it. It's hard to, for businesses to maybe put their money where their mouth is. And so this isn't about trying to create a revenue stream. This is about trying to drive change. And, um, you know, I, I, who knows where we will go with it and what we will do. I'd love to be adding more value. I'd love when we get maybe 12, 24 months in and we've got a certain number of businesses that have signed the pledge, that have completed the roadmap, that are able to demonstrate the journey what that happened? they've been on. Yeah. yeah, then we'll look at what else we can do and how we can expand that because the, the, the amount of people that want to, to get involved with this has been phenomenal. Yeah. So, you know, again, let's do it. Maybe we just needed that. We needed somebody to create a vehicle and say, look, here it is. Yeah, no, I love that. <laughs> Super simple. 
<laughs> education, action, I get it. I, I think it's great. I think the pledge makes complete sense. It's worked in other industries and will equip business owners on, on the know-how and the plan, but also um, there'll be a bit of accountability there in these things, um, which will help them visualize and see the impacts, which is important, but and then also inspire others to go, oh, wow, that business is doing that, this business, that, like those things, right? So um, what the other thing that I wanted to ask when you was uh, talking was, um, so covered off the, the players, the roadmap was, why do you think it's, why do you, f I, I know you said it's been overwhelming the amount of people reached out on these things, but like, why do you think it's been um, received like that? Why do you think that so many people have sort of reached out um, and I know you said that I, I agree. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you're confident that this would resonate with people. But why do you think it's sort of really cut through the noise and resonated with a lot of people? And why do you think there's been a huge sort of uptake in interest? Um, I think timing has been everything. Um, and I would say that the fact we've been in lockdown, the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and it has impacted every single person out there has made a massive difference. And there will be individuals, the types of which I've referred to earlier on, the individuals that maybe just didn't get it, that didn't see mental health as a thing or, you know, who have maybe struggled. Um, these are certainly the conversations that I've been having. Individuals that have had good mental strength have struggled in lockdown. Um, you know, the stats that have been coming out, I think it was the Mind Report that talked about people that had never had them before. I think it was something like 25% are now saying they, they have, um, you know, they've, they've felt um, a mental health issue or anxiety or some stress or whatever it is what, during so, uh, COVID yeah during lockdown and um, you know there's some there is some great research that's sort of out there at the moment and UCL U University College of London are doing this sort of ongoing COVID social study so I think you know that puts it on everybody's radar you know I've certainly been the busiest that I've probably ever been in this space in the last three months um, you know I've, I've talked a lot about how to combat feelings of stress and anxiety and overwhelm uh, in, in the situation that we've been in. And I think that's probably what's touched, you know, people get it. And uh, don't get me wrong, you know, uh, at the beginning, I, if, you, if you look at the Mental Health and Recruitment Instagram page, which is only, it's not even three months old, the reason that I, I kind of pushed the button on that and created it when, when I did was because I was also seeing the same posts of, of people that wanted to talk about mental health because we're in a pandemic. And the frustration for me was like, well, hold on a minute. You know, I've been trying to talk about this for seven <laughs> years. Yeah, you know, it's, and I'm great. It's brilliant. We're, we're talking about it. But my first, my first Instagram was, you know, mental health is for life, not just coronavirus. So, you know, it's brilliant that we've created a bit more awareness. It's brilliant that more leaders are kind of thinking, oh, okay, look, even I'm, I'm kind of not impenetrable when it comes to these sorts of issues um, but this is an ongoing thing we all have physical health the same way we all have mental health and you know some people are going to be I, my mental health is probably better than my physical health you know I don't I don't go to the gym and work out like I should but I work my mental agility my flexibility of thinking constantly so you know we are all different and it's making sure that as employers we have a duty of care to our people that covers both of those different different sides of the coin sure and how so how do you think um this period like what do you think will stay what, like in terms of what how do you think this period will have a lasting impact on sort of the discussion and topical mental health as as we come out of this like what what are you hoping will actually stick because as you quite rightly said yeah there's obviously way more people talking about it, which is great but i think it's and you always hear this from the people that are sort of really trying to drive change throughout and then you hear see and read these things around after mental health week which is mental health awareness week isn't just for a week and all these things right so so i, I get it but i'd like to think there'll be things that will, ch uh, will stay and keep during this period positive things but what what are you hoping will, will stick um yeah the big one for me is i'm hoping the empathy will stick um I know what it's like to be a leader. I know it's hard when you're trying to, you know, juggle the needs of the business with the needs of the people. But empathy is such a powerful tool and such an important tool in leadership. And, you know, I think the empathy has come from and been driven by the fact that we've all been feeling what we've been feeling. Maybe some of us have struggled and not dealt with it as, as well as we thought we might. And it's retaining that. It's understanding that, crikey, if I can just remember how it felt, 
in that situation and take that into the everyday life, the workplace, when we get back to the new normal, that actually, no, it is important we look at this. I think that's a big thing for me. I want the empathy to stay. And I also want the, um, I want the mindset, the, the mindset shift to stay. So, you know, I'm always talking about growth mindset. I'm always talking about challenging yourself and not being bound by, you know, this, this level of, well, this is the way it is. This is the way it is because it's the way it's always been. And this is the way it is because this is the way that, you know, I've, I've said it is. And so many business leaders in the last three or four months, um, many maybe would have never considered having their workforce work from home right well we don't do that we because our culture so um, no no no. It, it, that's just not the way it is and they've been forced to come out of their comfort zone they've been forced to lean into discomfort and i think what they've seen is it's positively impacted their people it's definitely improved the relationship that they've got with their staff the transparency piece is brilliant and it helps with trust and I, that's the stuff that that's what drives good business and that's what i'd like to see tap on as we come back to the new normal yeah i like that so let's so i think by this point we've covered a lot of the good things i think people listening will know that talking about mental health is important that um it's something that we need to sort of do more around particularly as an industry but what, why don't we talk about some of the the challenges that people have with this right because we were talking before because i think this is really important all about being open and honest on here so i think that the first the first challenge which i feel like could actually translate into talking about it internally but i think there really is this sort of perception that it's it's cool to talk about mental health right now right it's and, and i think that can sometimes really prevent people to talk about it even if they might their intention might be true and, and genuine and authentic but i think there is this sort of um what's the word since it's like cynicalness to yeah. ah ronda just talking about mental health because yeah it's, it's a good thing to talk about and these things and i think that can really prevent people talking about it and be worried about talking about it internally and also externally do you think that's some how can we combat that do you think because there's definitely people out there that do it to um yeah i guess helps them with their brand and all these things but i don't know how can we change that do you think because i do think that stops people from wanting to talk about it god i think you're bang on there and it, uh, that's probably a topic for a whole other podcast <laughs> um there's an accountability piece within it you know and i think that um if somebody wants to drive change if somebody wants to get involved um, whether it's a business owner that's trying to get their staff to talk about it, you know, more people will always be fearful. They'll be fearful that it's faddy. They will question probably the reasons why a leader that's paid no interest in this previously now wants to encourage talking. And this is where role modeling is absolutely vital. You cannot expect people to open up and be vulnerable to you if you cannot open up and be vulnerable to them. And this is why a big part of sort of driving any sort of cultural change, going back to the roadmap and uh, the awareness to action pledge, there has to be a senior stakeholder and there has to be somebody that is sharing themselves and is, is open to sharing. And, you know, at the beginning of the year, I spoke to somebody in the industry, um, very well-respected individual, someone who I respect uh, very much. And that person said to me, the problem you're going to have, Rhonda, getting individuals and businesses talking about mental health is the perception that if they support and if they're talking and if they're trying to drive change, that maybe they'll be viewed as having a mental health issue themselves or there was, there's a problem in their business. And I get that. But that's exactly the kind of stigma that we need to kind of shift from. Um, so I, I, it, it shocks me that to some degree that is that the case? Is there a huge proportion of our industry that will never talk about it because they're scared of what people think of them? No, I think that's probably right. I think there are you know, pockets of, of recruitment that are built on ego. Um, I think there are pockets that really do care about making sure that people are looked after. And what we need to do is just evolve, um, you know, evolve our, our sector into the space whereby people are first. Because, you know, if you are talking to businesses and if you are talking to your clients and your candidates about being the right recruitment partner to be using and you're talking about the fact that you will put them first as a customer or as a, as a client, um, you kind of got to be able to demonstrate that you're, you're doing that internally, first of all. So there's just a complete lack of authenticity about your brand and your product. So, um, you know, you've got to walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think for me, how I sort of, 
sort of um, can relate to this is when I work recruiters on helping them build their brand and these things time and time again, I'll, I'll sort of get the question of, Oh, he should, what, what if people think of me like this? Or if I say this, are people going to think I'm like this? And my response always, which I feel like is relevant to this, but it's a bit more complex is that if you're, if that's who you are, then that's how you're going to be perceived. So if you are someone that is using mental health as a vehicle to elevate your brand, sort of be perceived in a good light, and that's not true, you, you will get found out. And that, that works the same way as if you're opening up because um, it's, you know it's important and you recognize that it has to start with you and that's your intention and it's not the latter, then that will also be seen. Do you know what I mean? I think that that's how I relate to it is if you are generally being honest and authentic and intentions, right, then that, that will be seen. Some people may not see that straight away, but I think over a period of time, whether, okay, yeah, no, yeah, Rhonda definitely is, she, she means this, the intention's right. Um, and <clears throat> I think the thing where, so when you're talking about that, I think, especially in the recruitment world, when you say, leaders have to lead by the front and talk and these things. I think sometimes people's minds go straight away. Well, does that mean that I have to open up about my deepest, darkest secrets? Does that mean that I, aren't I, aren't I showing weakness by talking about these things? I just feel like some people will, as soon as you start going, look, Rhonda, you're the leader of this business. You need to start talking and these types of things. I, I feel like straight away people's minds can wander to, Oh, I'm not sure about that. Is it weakness? Is it sort of, talking to people about things that I shouldn't be do you know what I mean I think I think you're really a, a brilliant point and absolutely vital there is a difference between being a leader who's demonstrating and role modeling that vulnerability is okay and that it's all right to talk about these things and then forcing people to have to do the same about you know you have to safeguard, you have to make sure that you're looking after your people. And the aim is that you're putting practices, support, initiatives, policy in place to help them. You're not demanding that they share your, their deepest, darkest secret, secrets. You're not demanding that they are um, being vulnerable. What, what you're trying to do and what we're asking businesses to do is to create a safe space for people to bring them, bring themselves and be their whole selves and not have to hide that you know not every day is maybe easy and that they can get through it and there's there's all manner of ways in which you can address this and it could be that you know you own the business you're sat and you're discussing this sort of, uh, uh, as part of board as part of strategy and you're going to impact or amend your sickness absence policy Isham, and you're going to include mental health days in that so you know i think talking about it is about the leadership authenticity and building trust you know um you've heard me talk about brain chemistry before and the importance of building trust and transparency and leadership. And this is what, this is the benefit for people to be able to do that because it's not going to happen overnight, you know? And, and I think you're right. People often say to me, well, we've got mental health first aiders. Does that mean we're covered? And I almost feel like it's great that you've got mental health first aiders, but first of all, do you have the right people as mental health first aiders? Typically, the very empathetic individuals that want to get involved and want to support will put themselves out and say, yes, I'd like to be involved. But they're maybe not given the training around how to set relevant boundaries and how to manage these emotions. And, and, and quite often you can have individuals that absorb some of these problems and try to fix and they're not the right people. So there is something to be said for sort of looking at external strategies and ways in which you can help your people. And that's kind of, you know, a part of the, you've seen the mental health and recruitment. One of our collaborations is with Need to Chat, Ben Kenwright's initiative. And, you know, that isn't mental health support, but that is community-based peer-to-peer support where people can talk about things that they're dealing with, their day, their struggles, without fear of judgment. And, and that's really important. So, you know, I, th I think you're absolutely right. It's not about saying to people, you have to expose yourself and you have to share. But maybe what it is, is, is an individual that sees a colleague talk about the things they're struggling with and almost resonates with them that, oh, OK, I'm not the only person dealing with that. And that in itself helps massively you know this, the, the, if you look at some of mine's key insights for i think it was 17 18 it may be the, the next one you know mine are talking about the fact that it is proven to help people it's proven to make feel, people feel better when they talk about the issues that they've got and they and they share what it is that they're dealing with so kind of i think 
yeah there's a whole i think there's a whole host yeah. of, of work no no i think you done. no i think yeah. you've yeah you've answered that really well so the the second the second challenge then that i'm, I'm going to now take this to being in the leader's shoes and some of the challenges or perceptions that they may have because because i've heard this right so the other challenge that I've, I've heard, which I think would be interesting to get your thoughts on, is for, on the other side where, as a leader, you've got um, a, an employee who you think is potentially using their mental health issues as a bit of an excuse, as you're then questioning sort of the intention of or the sincerity of Ronda going, you know what, I'm really struggling, he should, blah, 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 and I'm your leader. I think that's a really interesting challenge and a hard thing to deal with as well, because then you've got leaders who may think that, but and then they're really worried about handling that in the wrong way, their their reputation or not wanting to make things worse. So, but I think there's a whole thing there, which again, I feel like can prevent leaders taking action or getting involved or whatever, because then sometimes they might have had an experience where their gut's like, you know what, I'm not... I just don't know if Rhonda's being truthful here and she's telling me that she's really struggling, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't know if you've heard that, but I've heard that quite a lot. And I think that's that that's also really hard as a leader to judge that. That's hard as well, I think. I think you're right. And I would say that, you know, I've, I've certainly come across what you're talking about myself as a leader. And, you know, the, on the other side, the other the, the kind of the flip side of that with regards to supporting our people and knowing what to do is having the right framework in place with regard to your process and policies and understanding the HR side of it, understanding what should be in place and making sure that, you know, you know what process you should be following. Because again, so many businesses that I'm talking to and have spoken to in the last two years may outsource their HR support. So they won't necessarily know that these are things we need to look at. This is how we have a conversation. We'll have a welfare meeting at this point. We'll refer to the sickness absence policy at this point. You know, I guess what I'm advocating for and the changes that I'm looking to see are about humanizing the way in which we deal with our people but mm. that doesn't mean that we cannot have a robust hr practice and policy in place you know and and i've introduced i think into two different businesses i've worked with the bradford index and the bradford index is something that measures short-term persistent absence you know and again if it's used in the right way it's a vehicle for conversation and you can support and you can help people but typically you know we don't look at that do we you know you've just sort of mentioned that Maybe it's a gut instinct, a leader having a chat with somebody, you know, and absolutely, I would never say to a recruitment business leader, oh yeah, you know, just give them this amount of time off, just give them a, you know, be really supportive. It's not about the fluffy side of it. It's about running your business effectively, running your business in line with the health and executive, the health and safety executives wishes that, you know, around your duty of care and kind of doing it, doing it the right way and being human about it. That's yeah, I think of, this comes into the education piece again, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think that's where sometimes the frustration can be is like you're, you've got to the point where you've got someone telling you that they find it really difficult, but you're not sure how sincere that is. You Like your gut's telling you're not sure, but before all of that's even happened, you've got no sort of framework like you're talking about. You've got no process that could have helped you prevent getting to this point or you feeling that way. So I think, yeah, that you're right. I think that ties into leaders, as you said, have being more educated and like having processes in place that can help them with situations like that, which starts with normalizing the conversation <laughs> about it all, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's having those conversations. It's knowing what the process is. It's knowing, for example, that, you know, you, you can offer to make reasonable adjustments to support people. It's knowing that if this is an ongoing condition, if it's been a condition maybe for two years, that then that comes into the Disability Discrimination Act. There is, it, there is so much information out there that I don't think we look at because we're kind of scared to go down the rabbit hole and, and, for, and oh God, what could happen? It could be a nightmare. Yeah, cool. As we, as we come to the end of this then, let's, let's just talk about what, so what have you got on the, uh, I know you've been working your absolute socks off, but what, what's on the sort of roadmap for mental health and recruitment then? So as you said, you launched a couple of weeks ago, people, um, it's been received really well, got people that are really bought into it. What, what's on, on the uh, roadmap for mental so health and recruitment? 
uh, what's on the agenda? First and foremost, what we're looking at is um, almost roles and expectations for the champions and the ambassadors. And that stemmed from the amount of interest that we've had and the individuals that want to be involved. So what we've decided is we need to have a bit more of a framework around that so that the people that are getting involved kind of know what it means to be a mental health and recruitment champion and, and maybe tie in, um, you know, some activities around that regarding the pledge you know and this isn't something i've talked to everybody about just yet but kind of how i see this evolving is this is a way that our champions can make tangible difference out in the industry um, outside of uh, the roles we've then got the awareness to action pledge that needs to be launched we've got the podcast which is obviously continuing so um, constantly looking for people to sort of talk to about that um, and there are some conversations happening at the moment, some really exciting conversations about, um, I can't say too much, but collaborations <laughs> with <laughs> some, some well-known people in the industry and some not so well-known people outside of the industry. But if that happens, that will be absolutely amazing because that will drive the awareness of mental health and recruitment forward. And it will also potentially support our community regarding their actual mental health issues I, I don't mean to be cagey but <laughs> we're okay. all kind of dealing with this at the moment and you know for those that don't know the other side of it is that this isn't just a UK initiative you know we are we're talking to Australia we're talking to the US we're talking to New Zealand I've had somebody contact me from South Africa somebody else contact me from Belgium so this is about providing um, you know change to the industry at a global level so there's lots and lots and lots to do and uh, to all the people that are saying you know can we get involved what we can, what can we do if anyone's got any ideas about what they could be doing to support absolutely please contact us love that I think it's great what you're doing, Rhonda, honestly. Um, so look, parting words then. Um, if, if, if I'm listening right now, when I guess just parting words on sort of, if I'm someone that might be having a tough time, I'm someone that doesn't feel like I've got any outlet in the sort of circumstances and, and recruitment business that I'm in. Um, I guess, yeah, what, what would your sort of advice be to anyone that right now feels like, they would like to talk to someone or is struggling or whatever just I guess just some parting words around that I guess I, I think talk to somebody that you trust if you can in the first instance you know it doesn't have to be somebody in recruitment but maybe two or three different people that you can have a safe conversation with and you can tell them how you're feeling and if genuinely people the idea of doing that creates a level of anxiety within itself. You know, the Samaritans offer a free um, number. You can, there, are, there are multiple places that you can speak to people and get support. And on the Mental Health and Recruitment um, website, what we have is a list of mental health support um, resources for a number of different things. They're not generic ones. They are, um, whether it's men's mental health, whether it's eating disorders, whether it's, uh, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. So maybe have a look, but, but don't stop talking. I think that's my biggest piece of advice. Please don't stop talking. Love that, Rhonda. It's been uh, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me.